Shalom family. I know it's been a while since you guys have seen me, but there's been a lot going on and I've been doing a lot. Trying to get the next presentation, the next teaching prepared because it's going to be a really, really in-depth the next time. But in the midst of doing that, the Lord dropped a word in my spirit. And so we're going to go over that today. It's going to latch on to another teaching I did, which was called Hidden in Plain Sight. So this will like be like part two of that because this is another segment that I feel like was strongly hidden in plain sight that not too many people pay attention to. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that this word falls on good ground. Lord, I ask that all hearts and minds are clear so that they can focus on you. There are so many things that are going on around us, Lord, that are causing distractions. I ask that you allow the distractions to stand still so that you can work miraculously in our life, Lord. Lord, I thank you for all that you have done for us, Lord. I thank you for all that you are going to do. Lord, even though it might seem weird or kind of crazy the way that the situation is that is surrounding us, But we thank you that you will never leave us nor forsake us. In Yeshua's name I pray. Amen. We're going to come out of Daniel chapter 6. And it reads, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom a hundred and twenty prince, which shall be over the whole kingdom and over these three presidents of whom Daniel was first that the prince might have accounts unto them and the king shall have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and prince because an excellent spirit was in him and the king thought to set him over the whole raiment. So, In just this small segment, we see that King Darius set people in high office. Now, among those ranks was Daniel. But because of the spirit that was on the inside of Daniel, which was a good spirit, King Darius really liked Daniel. He put Daniel over the presidents and the prince. Now, what what really stood out and had me to read further into this was like, I never paid attention before that the word president was in the Bible. And it's amazing how this comes out during the time when we came close to election time again, where the new president or the new president has to be chosen or the old president continues to stay in office. So I knew I needed to read further and find out what it is that the Lord is trying to say, you know, to me within these segments. We're going to read on. Then the presidents and the prince sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there an error or fault found in him. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Now, I want you to remember that last part, that they said they couldn't find any fault in, in, in Daniel. The only way they'll be able to find fault in Daniel if they find if, except they find it against him concerning the law of his God. Because Daniel did no wrong. So they found a way to set Daniel up. And the way that they did it was they went to the king and had the king write a written decree. And in that written decree, it would not allow anyone to bow down and worship. So Daniel was accustomed to bowing down and worshiping, kneeling and worshiping God 
three times a day. And they followed Daniel and watched Daniel, waiting for him to actually go against the decree that King Darius had put out. Now, it was a type of decree that once it got stamped, once it got sealed, once it was, it was like set in stone with them. Meaning even King Darius, because of the way it was done, couldn't do anything against it. He had to follow the decree that was signed by him. A full-fledged setup. So, once they tricked him and found him, you know, and put, brought him in front of Darius to let him know he's going against the decree that you put out, Darius. And your thing was, if somebody goes against it, they must be killed. So, he had to put Daniel in the lion's den. He did not want to put Daniel in the lion's den. Like I said, King Darius looked up to Daniel. He really liked Daniel. That's the reason why he put him in such a high position. He loved the spirit of Daniel. So, he had to put Daniel to death. But... Even before he put Daniel in the lion's den, one of the things he said was, I hope that your God delivers you, Daniel. And God did. There are times where we go through tests. And in the midst of going through that test, we see the obstacles before us. And some of us, after seeing the obstacles that are before us, we ready to back down. We ready to turn away. We'll be quick to tell God, hold on, God, wait a minute. They talking about, you know, taking my life. If, you know, I continue to worship you, if I continue to bow down, if I continue to praise you, they talking about taking my life. I ain't signed up for all that, Lord. Oh, hold on, wait a minute. I ain't, I don't think I could do that. I might have to change my mind and not do any worship. You know, maybe I find another private area where nobody can't see me because they don't brought me before the king. Maybe I should tell the king that, you know, that they, they, they lying on me. I wasn't worshiping. This is what people are going to face in the end times. And the reason why I'm saying that, because the Bible said that some people are going to be martyred during that day, meaning they're going to be killed because of their belief. But the thing is, will you be ready to go through something like that when those things come up? Will you be ready and and fully committed and fully trusting and believing in Elohim? Daniel fully trusted and believed in Elohim. Now, I can tell you the truth. Going in that lion's den, I'd have been shaking, but yet trusting. Because that whole thing of what I'm seeing. This is why the Bible tells us that we walk by faith and not by sight. Things that you see can be deceiving. A person can paint a pretty picture. Showing you, yeah, this is how my life is. Yeah, man, I'm living it up over here. Everything sweet on this side. When it really ain't sweet on that side. They going through pure, you know what, on that end. Oh, because they're trying to put up a facade with other people instead of being truthful. See, some people don't understand when they actually being judged by God because of their choices. They feel like, oh, wait a minute, I'm not being judged by God. This is, you know, this is, uh, the earth is punishing me. The universe is punishing me. The universe has it set this way just for this moment, you know, in time. But what the Bible says, it says that God chastens those whom he loves. If you are a child of God, you're not going to be able to really walk away. If you are a child of God, you're not going to be able to run for very long. You might get like in a little area. But you got to come back because the longer you stay out there, the more things that are going to come your way, the more you're going to be chastised. And the chastisement to you, you might be able to handle it in the beginning, but it don't get better. It's just like the birthing pains that the Lord was talking about in the end times. They start off gradual and then they continue to increase more and more. And as, as that increases more and more, it becomes harder for you to bear. Now, some of us real stubborn. I mean, I mean, it's just like the Bible said, like the Israelites. He called them jokers stiff neck. You stiff neck people. Out of all the things that I've shown you, out of all the times I've brought you out of these different things, and here it is, you can't even acknowledge that it was me. You used to believe in me. You used to trust in me. Because you did all that praying and crying to me when you wanted me to deliver you out of Egypt. 
But now that I don't deliver you out of Egypt, you act like you don't know me. You ready to get a credit to somebody else. You ready to bow down to another God, a God that you can actually see. And that's what they did. Or some people nowadays make themselves gods. No. Sorry. That's not what it is. Remember I told you in another segment that you can call yourself God all you want. But you the God with the little G. God with the very little power. And you, and especially if you walk away from prayer, you ain't even praying no more. You already know with prayer comes power. So you ain't praying. You That pretty much means you ain't got no power. None whatsoever. So we're going to move on a little further. I had to catch you up to that. We're going to jump so we can connect the dots in other areas within the Bible. And where we're going to jump to is we're going to jump to the book of John. We're going to go to John, hmm, John 18, 31, 32. Then said Pilate unto them, take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, it is not lawful for us to put any man to death. Really? It ain't lawful for you to put any man because you don't want to get your hands dirty. So you're going to set it up for somebody else to have the man killed. But it reads on and says that the saying of Yeshua might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he shall die. This is in a lot of areas. Yeshua himself told them about how he was going to die. Now, it was pretty harsh to them about that way of dying, but that's what was going on back then. People were dying by crucifixion. And that he already knew that that's the way that he was going to die. I remember looking at uh, another uh, YouTube page, and they brought some things to light. They say, you got to understand that from a young age, Yeshua knew how he was going to die. Crucifixions was going on even when he was young. I can only imagine him going by or watching somebody die by crucifixion. Seeing them sit up there and actually go through and suffer. Seeing that when some of them didn't die fast enough for everybody, that they would find another way to kill them. Seeing that that would be him one day that's a hard you know thing to take on especially at a young age to know what you was going to have to go through but he was prepared he knew what he was placed for he was placed here for to do his father's business we're going to jump again into John, we're going to only move over a little bit to 19, 6, and 7. Then the chief priest, when the chief priest, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, take ye him and crucify him. For I find no fault in this man. Basically, Paul was saying, you crucify him. I don't see nothing that this man did that, that's wrong. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and by our law, he ought to die. Because he made himself the son of God. Remember, I told you to remember what was said during the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, they said that the only way we can find fault in Daniel is if we find it in the law of his God. That's the only way we'll be able to trip Daniel up. Here it is. We find out that the, the chief priests and others search through the law to try so that they can put Yeshua to death. They did the exact same thing. And if you jump down to verse 12, it says, and from henceforth, Pilate sought to release him. Pilate didn't want to take him down. Pilate didn't want to kill him. He didn't see a reason why he needed to do it. So he tried everything in his power to try to let him go. 
But the Jews cried out saying, if thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh, whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. So they knew that Pilate was wavering, that he really didn't want to put Yeshua to death. So what they decided to do and let, uh, they decided to let Pilate know, if you let him go, you're not a friend of Caesar's. Because this man calling himself a king. You can't let him call himself a king. Not if Caesar is the king. We, Caesar is above. We can't be uh, letting nobody else be above Caesar. Before, remember I told you in Daniel, the presidents and the prince didn't like it that Daniel was above them. So they sought and looked for ways to take him down. We're going to jump into Matthew. We'll turn back, in a, but we're going to go into the book of Matthew 27, 24 through 25. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. So he was letting him know, I wash my hands of this situation. You're not finna put this on me of taking this man's life. This is your choice and not mine. So make sure you, you make record that this has nothing to do with me. And this is not a decision that I really wanted to make. This is not something I really want to do. Then answered all the people, not just the chief priests, but all the people that were around at that time and said, his blood be on us and our children. Now, that's a true statement of what they was making in so many levels. Think about it. We are, we were sinners. Before you got saved, once you got saved, then the blood of Yeshua covers you so that when Elohim looks at you, he does not see your sin, but he sees his son's blood that covers you. Another time when covering was going over was when they covered the doorposts with the blood of the lamb so that death could pass them over. The only way death can pass you over today is if you're covered by the blood of the lamb. Let's see another area of a covenant that locked them in with God in Exodus 24, 5 through 8. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar, which is the altar of the Lord. Half went on the altar, the other half went in a basin. Let's find out and see what he did with that basin. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the con in the audience of the people and they said all that the lord had said will we do and be obedient and moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said behold the blood of the covenant which the lord hath made with you concerning all his words see the lord's words had already went out and it's not going to return unto him void one of the words that went out, as we found out later on, the words of the Lord was that Yeshua was going to come. He was going to die. And by his blood, we will be saved. So they were locked into the covenant. And a way that they that to signify them being locked in was by sprinkling them with the blood. The same blood that came from the oxen. In order to cover their sins. In order to lock them in. With the covenant that God had made with them. These are some areas that were in plain sight. 
See, the story of Daniel was another foreshadow. Not saying that it wasn't a true story. That drives me crazy when people are like, oh, that's not a true story. How can you say that? You don't know. You have no idea. And you're probably saying the same thing about me. But let me bring some truth to the table. If I write a story about me, my life, to me, it's my life. And it is a true story. I ain't put no fiction in there. It's about my life. Now, names probably got changed. Most stories will change names. But say I decided not to change names. I kept the names the same. Because my thing, as long as I ain't attaching a last name to it, you won't know who I'm talking about anyways, unless you know me. But then with the way that, that our life goes, you still might not even know the person. So here it is. They were in covenant with the situation. All because of the blood. You got Daniel's story that unlocks truth of what was going to happen to Yeshua. From all the way down into Exodus, we see that the only way our sins could be completely covered is by the Lamb of God. The only way we could be set free from the curse of sin is by somebody coming to pay the sin debt, which was Yeshua. I'll take you to another area within the Bible. During the time of Abraham, God asked Abraham to go sacrifice his only begotten son. Now, was that his only begotten son? No. Mm -mm. But was he under the lineage that led to the line of Yeshua? He was. So this is why he was the one that was pinpointed. He was the promised child. He was the actual child that was supposed, the only child that was supposed to actually be brought here according to the words of the Lord, if Sarah wouldn't have took it among herself to try to handle it herself. So he goes up to get ready to sacrifice his son. Remember, I told you about that test thing. When you're going through a test, God wants to see just how far you will go, just how much you would trust him. I mean, I do the whole thing. I'm shaking, Lord, but yet and still, I trust you. Job did the same thing. Now, Abraham up on this mountaintop, he did everything to a T as though he would normally do it if you're doing a sacrifice. His son look around and like, okay, we got the wood. We got the fire going. But where's the sacrifice? Now, I know he definitely, his heart had to be breaking at this time. He had to bind his son up and put his son on the altar. Can you imagine a child looking up at their parent like, what are you doing? Well, why are you binding me up? Those binds that he stuck on, on Isaac represented a form of his slavery. He was in bondage. And he was at the mercy of the father. He thought he was at the mercy of his earthly father, but it wasn't that. He was at the mer mercy of the heavenly father. And once the heavenly father understood that Abraham was actually trusting him fully, he told him, don't you touch that child. Don't do that. Because now I see just how much you trust me, just how far you will go for me. And the Lord provided the lamb just as Abraham spoke out. Just as he prophesied. And once he found that ram attached to the bush, he sacrificed the ram. That ram took the place of Isaac. He was part of the promise. That ram was the connection. That, that covenant that was taking place even at that time. And God was doing a foreshadow of things to come, of what is ahead. Remember, I write a story about myself. I publish it. To you, it's just a story. But to me, that was my life. That's what I lived. That's what I experienced. That's what I went through. You can't take that away from me just because I decided to write it down on paper and say that it ain't true. Now it don't became a fiction. Because now you lie. 
the Lord wants us to know that time is drawing near. Those who are not saved, you need to get saved. The Lord says to seek him while he may yet be found. Because there's going to come a time where you're not going to be able to seek him. Those who are real rebellious, he's going to give you up open to your reprobate mind. Don't fall in that category. Be watchful, as the, the Bible says. Be diligent. Be sober. Be fasting. Be praying. Be waiting, knowing that your Savior draws near. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for allowing this word to fall on good ground, to take root and do exactly what it's supposed to do. Lord, I thank you that your people will receive this word and it will not get choked out. Anything that is trying to come against this word, Lord, we rebuke it in your darling son's name, in Jesus' name, in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Shalom, family.